Uh, we weren't even able to get it through the Senate during that period. We have an $18 trillion debt. Our military is being cut to pre-World War II levels. We're using the military as a social engineering lab. The, the threats to this nation are real, and we have to prioritize what are we going to do. Yes, we should proceed with impeachment hearings, but we have to look down the road. Are we going to waste our time when the Senate is, is going to just kick it back, or do we focus our priority on doing some of these things that are immediate and inherent, such as repealing portions of Obamacare, defunding Obamacare, uh, beginning to address this incredible debt, and restoring our military to ensure that our, say, our citizens are safe and secure here in our own borders. Folks, Putin has taken out of mothballs the Bear H bombers that we intercepted when I was in the Air Force in Alaska. And they're flying off the coast of America today. We have a clear and present danger just to secure our nation. We need to do something about immigration. So yes, I support going forward with uh, investigations into impeachment. But if we can't finish the job, then we probably shouldn't go ahead with the drill. So as a party, one of the greatest challenges we have is spending back the Democrats' self-proclaimed uh, prophecy that we have a war on women. And as I look around the room, I see, it looks like to me, Scott, more women than men. I would be remiss if I did not note that one of those women happens to be my lovely bride, Linda, right here in the front row. Notice how I got that in, everybody. <laughs> but my question for the two of you is forget all of the issues that normally dominate these debates and talk to us about specifically the issues that are important to the women who are over one half of our registered voters what, what is the message you have for them as you head to Congress? Well, regarding the war on women, my daughter and my wife keep advising me, said, if there's a war on women, it's coming from the left. It isn't coming from the right. I don't segregate between the issues of men and women because we have heard the same thing over and over again, regardless of gender. As I said earlier, we stood on the porch steps of over 60,000 voters in this district did 30 plus meet and greets, 10,000 phone calls so we could hear what the issues were to the voters in this district. And continually we heard over and over again, just go to Washington and stop. Tell Washington to stop trying to fix my problems. The number one issue we heard about was concerns about Obamacare whether their children would actually be able to receive the health care that they needed when they go to the doctor, is it gonna, they're gonna be told that it's not covered? Are, are their children actually going to have a future because of this debt and that Congress can't control itself and keep spending ourselves uh, into oblivion? I mean, these are the things that, that most of the women that we encounter on the campaign trail are expressing to us is, is their concerns. Their concerns are the growth of government the regulation that's over-regulating the businesses. In fact, I have one lady that said, you know what, I just lost my job because the, the, my employer closed the door because they just got tired of dealing with the regulations coming from Washington, D.C. Now I'm concerned about what I'm gonna do to make a living. The issues that women are facing in this state and this nation are the issues that we're all facing. And what I would say to the women is, stand with me. Let's go to Washington. And let's stop the progression of government. Let's stand together and limit government's influence on our life. We're all one party. We're all one people. Let's stand together. There was a story in the paper, I think, today in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution about this fellow Berg, Bergdahl. And it said that Bergdahl looks good. Well. Frankly, I don't care how good he looks. But what struck me is we make this big hoopla over an apparent deserter, and yet nobody says a word about the six brave soldiers, military personnel, who apparently were killed in operations directly related to or as a result of 
his leaving his post and then trying to find him. And can you imagine the anguish in those mothers' hearts as their sons were brought home in caskets? No fanfare, no big stories, no heroes welcome. The women of America care perhaps more deeply than a lot of us men realize that our nation is destroying the future. We're destroying individuals. We're destroying homes. We're destroying home places and families and jobs and small businesses. That women, perhaps even more than men in many senses, as those who give birth to our children and who have a special relationship to nurture those children and do everything in their power to provide a meaningful future for them as they see it being wrested away by the ill-advised, possibly criminal actions and policies of this administration, whether it relates to the economy or our national defense. That's why, despite Barry worrying about whether the Senate would go along with an inquiry or an impeachment, the time has come to try to do everything we can to hold this president and his administration accountable for taking away the future of not only our women, but their sons and their daughters. So let me just follow it up. Frank Luntz, who is, a, who is a good friend of all of ours and a great consultant, had an interesting statistic. He said that 70% of men judge the success of their lives by how their career goes. 70% of women judge the success of their lives by how the lives of their children go. And the number one issue they cared about was would they have a job, would they have a home, and would they have a life? Specifically, what are the things you would do to jumpstart this economy, create jobs, and otherwise help mothers understand that their children will have a better future than we did? Here again, I think, uh you know, one of your earlier questions, you know, it's difficult to, there are so many areas in which the federal government involves itself to the detriment of our communities, our homes, our schools, our businesses, our lives, that it's difficult to, you know, pick out in the short time that we have those things that would really make a difference. But what we have to do, ever, what, what we have seen build up ever since the so-called Great Society of Lyndon Baines Johnson, that was really, I think, the real start of the demise of the American economy and the growth of government. We have to stop looking to the government to solve every problem. It's not the government's job to create uh, jobs. It's not the government's job to make sure the economy does well. If it would just get out of the way, we'd have a booming economy. We are poised, for example, next year, to become the leading exporter of petroleum, even, even greater than Saudi Arabia. And yet this administration continues to do everything that it can to stop that and slow it down. What we need to do is stop the regulatory stranglehold that is actually growing, as bad as it is, it's growing. We have the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that is at, actually, you talk to mortgage brokers and bankers and credit unions, it is actually cutting off options for families to get mortgages. It is cutting off the ability of small businesses to get loans. So that, I think, Randy, is probably the first place to start to reinvigorate and reinstill a sense of hope for our children and our small businesses to stop this regulatory monstrosity that is killing us. And we have to do it, frankly, at all levels of government. Now, I can do my part, have done, and will do my part at the federal level, but we need to see the same thing happen at the state and the local level as well. The issues that we are facing in America and our economy are, are broad. <coughs> it's like they're coming from different directions. I sat with some physicians recently, and they said, we feel like we're getting attacked from all all directions. In fact, one physician was only 43 years old and had already decided he was going to retire. He said, because through Obamacare, I'm getting the overregulation on this side, and then through Dodd-Frank, I don't have access to 
uh, the capital I need to expand, and then all these regulations, HIPAA, and everything else coming up on me, I'm just tired of it. When he retires, three or four people, and some of those are women that have children, are losing their jobs. Washington is not the solution. Washington is the problem. We've tried things in the past. Obviously, those things haven't worked because we have, it hasn't just been during this administration. You go back and look at the Bush administration, we outspent ourselves much more than we ever should have. It's the, it's the Republicans and the Democrats. We can't continue to do the same thing over and over again. Of course, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. And I bet a bunch of you out there would agree that there's a bunch of insane people running Washington, D.C. today. So I need fresh and new ideas. Folks, just next year, although your health care costs are going up again, some of these taxes through Obamacare are about to hit. We have to start pulling back on Obamacare. Congress has to assert its authority to control the budget and start defunding portions of Obamacare. We would love to re repeal the entire Obamacare law, but reality is as long as he's in the White House, he'll He'll veto that bill, and we won't have the numbers to override the veto. So we have to strategically start pulling back on Obamacare because of the cost, and more so because of the liberty that it takes away from us. But we also have to do something with this debt. And the only way that you're going to force Congress to do something with the debt is through a constitutional amendment to force a balanced budget. And I am proposing let's put a balanced budget uh, amendment forward that goes into effect by 2030 and we give them a date certain to start moving toward balancing the budget. Thank you. Mr. Kirby's question will be our last question before closing statements. As uh, Republicans and the Republican presidential candidate two years from now search for winning issues, do you see trying to roll back the tide on gay marriage as a potentially winning issue or is that one that Republicans should just uh, forget about and cut the losses and move on. Uh, I, I think that this is, this is an issue that's really hitting home right here in Georgia. We're about to spend some taxpayer dollars defending against a lawsuit when the majority of the people in this nation or in this state in 2004 voted overwhelmingly to amend our Constitution to state that this state only recognizes marriage between a man and a woman. Because of some lawsuits that, that were filed against the Defense of Marriage Act that went to the Supreme Court, now it's opened a Pandora's box. Because of the full faith and credit provision in the Constitution, we looked at that and said, okay, well, it may be a state's issue, but what if Michigan honors a gay marriage and a Michigan couple moves to Georgia and we don't, what happens then? Now we've got a lawsuit that we're spending taxpayer dollars to defend. I think the overwhelming majority of the people in America agree that we should define what marriage is. That marriage, legally defined, is between a married uh, man and a woman. As far as a presidential candidate, I'm not sure if, if I could advise them of where to make a stand on that at this point. I think it's up to the people to determine if that is an issue. But again, I go back to the point is the things that are threatening this nation more than anything else is a growing national debt and a Congress that cannot regulate itself and cannot stop spending more than it takes in. Joe, I've had the opportunity over the last year certainly to travel the four counties that comprise in whole or in part the 11th district but I've been involved over the years and for well more than three decades here in Georgia in the private attorney private businessman President Reagan's US attorney member of Congress representing the people of then the 7th district and I hear a lot about a lot of different issues. But I have to tell you that over the course of the last year that I have been seeking the nomination, the Republican nomination, uh, for the 11th district to serve in the 115th, 114th Congress, uh, I hear a lot about taxes, regulation, saving Dobbins, fighting Brack, helping Lockheed, <coughs> tax reform, 
balancing the budget, stopping the regulatory state that's strangling our businesses, protecting our Second Amendment rights, stopping illegal NSA surveillance. Now, I have to tell you, I have not heard one person that has said to me, Bob, the most pressing issue is whether the presidential candidate in 2016 will champion gay marriage or whatever. It's not something that is on people's minds as we look to the congressional elections in 2014. That's not to say it's not an important issue, but it is to say that what I intend to focus on is not 2016, not the presidential issues in 2016, but saving jobs here in Cobb County, cutting federal spending, restoring our civil liberties, and rebuilding our military and the prestige of this country that has been squandered so deeply and so dangerously by this administration. Gentlemen, thank you for, uh, for taking the questions. Let's give them a hand. Okay, we'll do that. They both stood up well to some serious questions from our candidates tonight, from our panelists tonight, and we appreciate it. It's now time for closing statements. And uh, by coin toss, uh, uh, we, we decided the order, and uh, Mr. Ladder Milk will give the, fir the first closing statement. Thank you, Scott. Growing up here in Georgia, my parents instilled in me a certain set of values, values that we passed on to our children. Put God first in everything you do, serve others before yourself, and standing for what is right isn't easy, but it's always right. My dad served in World War II and he saw action in the Battle of the Bulge and D-Day, and as a medic, he saw the absolute worst of what humans can do to one another, but he always kept his eyes upon his cause, not the circumstances surrounding him. Another rule of life that my dad passed on to me that I have passed on to my children, which is never complain. Complaining never accomplishes anything. If there's something you don't like, he said, son, you can do something to change the situation or just accept it as inevitable and go on with your life, but never complain. In 2004, when I saw my state government going in the wrong direction, I heeded my father's advice. And I took my experience as a husband and a father, a small business owner and a veteran to the state capitol in, in Atlanta, where I served in the House and the Senate. And I consistently stood firm on those core American values of faith, family, and freedom. And because of that consistent stance on those issues, I became known as one of the foremost conservative leaders in the state. On July 22nd, you're going to have a decision to make. And that decision shouldn't be made on who had the best soundbite or who made the most boisterous campaign speech. But that decision should be, who do you trust? Who do you trust that can go to Washington and will live the values that they espoused in the campaign? Who do you trust that will go to Washington and work with other congressmen to actually come up with solutions for the issues that we face here in America? Who do you trust that will consistently stand firm for the values that have made America strong? And who do you trust will go to Washington and put the Constitution and the values of this dis district first, not grandstanding just to get on television or to be the news story of the day? And who do you trust? when the microscope of this campaign and the scrutiny of this election is over with, will consistently represent you in Washington, D.C. There are several conservative, national conservative organizations and the overwhelming majority of these organizations have, have, have looked into our voting records and they've looked into our campaigns. And virtually every one of them said, we stand with Barry. Concerned Women of America, Family Research Council, Madison Project, Freedom Works, Restore Our Republic, and national defense packs that we stand with Barry. Freedom Works named me the number five most conservative, or one of the top five most conservative candidates in the nation, and Senate Conservatives Fund named me the number two candidate running for the House of Representatives. Dozens of local elected officials have said, we stand with Barry to represent the issues that are important to this, to this district, such as Dobbins. And in a six-way primary, nearly 40% of the people in this district said, we stand with Barry to represent the values that we hold dear. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll stand with me on July 22nd, we'll take a major step to ensuring that our children have a future that is free, safe, and full of opportunity. God bless you and thank you for being here.
After closing, Mr. Barr. Thank you. Maybe I missed something, but you know, conservative groups saying they've looked into a voting record for somebody that hasn't cast a single vote and they like that voting record doesn't tell me, and I don't think it tells you an awful lot. Now, I have cast over 5,000 or right about 5,000 votes during my prior service in the Congress. It's there. My wife Jerry is here this evening. Our kids are here this evening. My best friend is here this evening. And they followed my career very carefully. They let me know every now and then when I cast a vote that they didn't agree with. So even my wife doesn't agree with every vote that I cast. But they know, as President Reagan did when he appointed me as his United States Attorney, as the top federal law enforcement official in the entire Northern District of Georgia, and they know as well, as did the voters of the old 7th District of Georgia, when they elected me to the Congress in 1994 and three times thereafter in re-elections, that even though they may not agree with every vote that Bob Barr took, or every position paper, or position that I articulated, they knew that when the chips were down, Bob Barr would be there fighting for them, fighting for the Constitution, fighting for the rights of this district, fighting for the rights of Georgians, fighting for jobs, fighting for Lockheed, and winning those battles time after time after time. That's an actual voting record. That's not some hypothetical voting record that some group somewhere looks into and says, oh, we like that. Fact of the matter is, these are serious times. Whether we look at the deterioration of our military abroad and our nation's security, or the deterioration of our economy at home, or the growth of the regulatory state that is strangling businesses large and small here in our very district. We can't wait 30 years. Doesn't do us any good to say, oh, when I go to Congress, I'm going to vote for a constitutional amendment that balances the budget in 30 years. We need folks that will go up there, know how to work the system so that we move our conservative agenda forward now, not in 30 years. When I served in the Congress on your behalf previously, there were those who said, well, those Republican upstarts might be able to balance the budget in 10 years. We did it in three. We did it by consistency, by hard work, by standing up to an administration and getting the job done. That's what I bring to this job that I'm seeking, and that is why, based on that record, it's not hypothetical, based on that record and your knowing me, working in your behalf for over three decades, that Bob Barr will represent the 11th District of Georgia well and move our conservative agenda forward. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have, uh, we have certainly heard much from our candidates tonight. We are proud of them, both of them, and let's give them both a big round of applause.